What's happening, Rodney? Cream of tartar. Mm. <laughs> like, uh, the first thing I think of is soup and teeth. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, cream of tartar. But it's a, it's a powder. It's apparently a byproduct of winemaking. Mm. And it's really, really high in potassium. And because I play around with the keto thing, like potassium, magnesium, sodium can be low at times. So I take this cream of tartar and put it in my apple cider vinegar drink, which I like to talk about on here because you know how I like my ACD. Throw it in there and make sure my potassium is good. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It doesn't taste like it tastes like talcum. And I don't know what <laughs> talcum tastes like. So I don't know why I just said that. I don't either. Maybe chalk. <laughs> but hey, you know, when you need your potassium, make it happen. I can't eat because I can't eat the banana because it's too sugary. Mmm. Mmm. Love... Hey, y'all. This is Keith. This is Rodney. And this is the More in Common podcast. Welcome. This is a place for genuine, authentic, conversation where we explore the fact that we all have more in common than that which divides us. And you can find us at www.moreincommonpod.com. It's where you can go and find all things us. Um, so check us out. W. And, and before we get into last week's episode, or last episode, let's uh, do what we like to do now, is read the amazing reviews that we keep we, we continue to get um, out there in, in the in the in the ether um and this one is from pete mulroy and one of our guests we're super super happy to have him on a little while ago uh he says i was honored when i was asked to be interviewed by rodney and keith i was very confused as i couldn't see what i could offer it hit me we all have something to offer as we are all in this together keith and rodney have a conversational approach rarely seen in this day of tribalism they are very educated, thoughtful, willing to explore ideas and do so in a very inclusive manner. I look forward to listening and learning. Keep up this important endeavor. With much grace, thank you, Mr. Pete. Thank you. Very educated. That might be a stretch, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so let's go back. Let's let's talk let's about um, our last Wait, guest, Mr. Mr. George Dover. Mm -hmm. What uh, did you take away from that conversation, my man? Universal truths. Uh, George talked about universal truths being the thing that gets in the way between two people trying to share a space. And I'm seeing it more and more. And I, and it, I don't think it means that people can't have and hold you know, a universal truth that is true for them. I guess that's not universal. That's like, well, no, it's something they may believe is a universal truth. Uh, they may believe that Jesus is the way, the light and the truth. Um, it's how they hold that in the space in between them and another person mm. that can get in the way between those two people connecting. And I'm just finding that to be very true with with so many things for me. What about you? Yeah, I mean, right off of that, uh, the, the uh, position on unconditional acceptance, like what that actually is and the depths of that conversation, it, it struck me, hit me. And especially as it relates, like, as we raise children and think about what we do to listen to them and hear them and, and accept some of their positions that will work, they had no experience with mental illness. And here they have a daughter who's going through some severe things and they had to listen to her. And, um, when he took her to, to be with horses to help her, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a, I think about that as I relate, as I raise my girls right and and how that will manifest over time so yeah, yeah. um but uh good stuff uh yeah, who do we is. have today today we have patrick furlong patrick is first a husband and a father who lives in la los angeles for those unawares patrick works as a case manager of community care and student affairs at loyola marymount university lmu before returning to his alma mater, he worked at Tom's Shoes, designing and leading international immersion experiences around the world for employees to connect to the mission of the company. Patrick has lived in four different countries and traveled to over 50 countries. He's a big supporter of the global learning initiatives. As an undergraduate, Patrick founded 
Magis, M-A-G-I-S, a student service organized dedicated to service, diversity, and spirituality. He's also a leader in alternative breaks and studied abroad in Ireland. He was awarded the Robert Graham SJ Award in 2006, which is presented to one outstanding graduating senior man and one woman who have excelled in service and leadership throughout their undergraduate careers. A man of many experiences and an amazing storyteller, we are excited to have him here with us today. Keith, what do we talk about? Curiosity. We talk about empathy versus compassion. We talk about millennials um, and navigating the appropriate actions in moments when our feelings don't necessarily align with how we would want to act in that situation. I mean, it's, and his stories are amazing. Uh, they definitely captivate you. So it's it's good. And and so what strikes you about this conversation, Rodney? How forthright and 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 generous Patrick is with telling us when he doesn't do the right thing. Um, and 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 looking back and just an earnest, he's not beating himself up, he's not being self-deprecating, he's just being honest about the situation because he's evaluated it and realized that his future self maybe wouldn't look back at that kindly. And I think it just it it gives uh it gives me a good lens, if nothing else, to say it's okay to make a mistake. You don't have to kick the crap out of yourself because of it, and you can become better for it. What about you? I mean, he lives the goodish life, right? As Dolly Chug would say, mm-hmm. and and he's open and honest, and he gives really good practical descriptions of of circumstances where you know he just he he he's got to navigate what it means to be the person he wants to be versus how he feels in any given moment. So Mm. I think it's, uh, it's just, it, and if I didn't cry at least twice listening back to this episode, I'd be lying to you, right? Like his stories are exceptional. He's just really good at telling them. So enjoy the show. We're really excited to bring it to you. And, you know, he was like, Dad, I want to do this. Like, why are you standing in my way? And his dad snapped and was like, I migrated to this country and lost everything I had to come here. Like, we restarted at zero at this place. And we've worked our butts off and everything we've done has been a sacrifice for you and your brother. And he's like, and now you're telling me you want to go back to that world that we escaped. Like, you want to do that? I'm insulted. I'm offended. I'm angry. And so we left the house that night and we're driving back to campus. And my friend was like... God, man, can you believe my dad? And I was like, yeah, actually, I can. Like, I can believe both of you, right? Like, I believe you and your desire and your parents formulated you in this way to get you to this space. And like, God, hearing your dad, I can't imagine that that feeling, you know? So I was like, how do we wrestle with the complexity that in that situation, I think both are right. Okay, we are humans and we love our families no matter where we're from, but like yeah. we first have to venture into the difference and kind of revel in what we learn in difference. And I think that's that same lesson here of like, how do I look at someone who's a baby boomer and have areas that I could not see as my part of my life and also just be like, okay, how do I find myself asking the questions of where is this coming from? Who are you? What can I learn from you? And then sure, come back to that same note. Before we get started with this episode, just a really quick note. The first three minutes and 30 seconds, four minutes are a little hard on the audio quality. Uh, we had a mic issue from the engineering, the audio engineer on the project, and you can't hear Patrick all that well, but just bear with us. It gets better. I promise. Just turn it up, listen close, and then it'll be better. All right. Thanks. Hello, welcome back. And uh, today we we are with Patrick Furlong. Patrick, hello. Hello. How are you? Good to be with you guys. Yeah. Hey, doing well. Doing great. It's been a Thank week. Thank you for asking. Gotta get Thank you. Out there. We're in hey, it's ahead. it's good. We're it's in combo good. mode. We, it's so it's so fun in these interviews, right? I'll, I'll air quote because we do we are conversationalists, right? But. It's when you're in that interview, like that dynamic, it's very much one-sided questions. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's good. We like it. 
Um, so speaking of interview questions though, right? Um, you have an amazing TEDx for, for those out there. You can look it up. Um, we'll post it when and we, when we do the episode. You, you, you talk a lot about curiosity's role in having compassion for others. Now, of course, we couldn't agree more. Um, it's core to our principles and connection and communication. But uh, how do you help people find curiosity, especially when emotions are high? Yeah, you know, I think like that talk, the ideas of it probably came into my mind several years ago. And then I think no matter where you kind of shift on that political spectrum, come 2016, it changed, right? Like everybody yeah. I knew, no matter what side you were on, you were just angry. Right. And yeah. you were heated. I remember yeah. kind of observing to a friend of mine who's more conservative. I was like, you won, but you're angry. Like, I don't get it. Like you won. You should be joyous. Um, so it's been really kind of rethinking that and retooling that. And I think one thing that we have to try and do as hard as it is, so I work in a university setting. Right. And I've realized some of the biggest things I can do is I'm in this weird stage where I'm in my mid thirties. I'm not so far removed from students that they see me as ancient but I'm also not adjacent to them, so to speak, in terms of age. And so it's modeling that behavior, right? And mm. so modeling with them how much I'm listening to them and asking questions and how I'm coming from a place of non-judgment and really just trying to understand where they're at. I think that other thing that I try and teach students is, you know, for better or for worse, our world right now is obsessed with how students network and how they connect to their career goals, et cetera. And so some of them kind of have this fear of networking. And I'm like, don't look at it as like you're going to a room and you're, you know, shaking hands stiffly, et cetera. I said, go ahead and just be curious about people. Like ask them questions and really want to know the answers of like, mm. how did you get here? Yeah. What's going on with you? What's the best part of your job? If you were to be real with me, what do you struggle with? And I think sometimes when we create that pathway where I say, if you ask someone 15 or 20 questions about themselves and you rarely say anything about yourself, that person leaves that room and they're like, man, that guy was great. Mm -hmm. Like he was just yeah. so nice. Right. And so yeah. Yeah. I think like more than ever, people just need to be heard. And if we can model that, it's huge. It's interesting. You say that I mentoring, uh, a lot. I've had a, I've been fortunate enough to mentor a lot of people where we work at Microsoft yeah. and, uh, mainly college hires. And they, one of the things I encourage them to do is have a ton of meetings with people. Yeah. They're like, how do I do that? And I'm like, <laughs> my first, my first piece of advice is ask them questions. Yeah. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. hundred percent. So if you ask them, where'd you come from? Why did you start studying what you studied? Well, how did you get here? And that'll open up everything else because people love talking about themselves. Right. I, I think you just captured it in a more elegant way. So it's, I, th I think that landing on that need to be heard component mm -hmm. is a message I think needs to be screamed loud and loud because it ultimately creates this almost hypocrisy, right? Like people yell because they want to be heard. Mm -hmm. Then the other people yell because they want to be heard, but neither person is hearing the other person. Mm. Yeah. And yet, so they just yell louder and then everybody feels attacked Yep. and everybody feels angry to your point. Like, you know, they, someone just, you know, they, they won, but they, they feel angry because yeah. it's almost like no one's hearing why, you know, it's, it's that perpetual question. If you see someone wearing a MAGA hat and you're, you're left of, of MAGA, I guess, you know, asking the question, like, what does that mean to you? <laughs> right. Hashtag like, left of MAGA. <laughs> Hashtag left of MAGA. Like, what does that mean to you? Right. Yeah. Like we, we assume it means this and yep. we just simply, you know, Get, flag it and then get mad about it instead yeah. of saying, you know, like, I mean, yeah. you are a person, right? Like that need to be heard thing is such a critical component of that. I oh, love I, it. Now, I now you have an, ex oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say real quick. So I think like we're also at this stage and I see this a lot in the university world. So I'd be really curious if you guys see this in your world too, of mm -hmm. like a lot of times the students I work with, they struggle to wrestle with complexity. So we live in this world where it's like, mm -hmm. I want it to either be this or I want it to be that and anything in between. Binary. Right. Right. So like I remember years ago when I was in college, a friend and I wanted to do something called post-grad service. So it's kind of committing to volunteer work as a career for one, two years, et cetera. So Peace Corps, Teach for America, those are kind of the common named ones. Mm -hmm. And my friend wanted to do it. And his dad and his mom were just fighting him every step of the way. And I went over to dinner at their house and it somehow came up at dinner. And, you know, he was like, dad, I want to do this. Like, why are you standing in my way? And his dad snapped and was like, 
I migrated to this country and lost everything I had to come here. Like we restarted at zero at this place and we've worked our butts off and everything we've done has been to sacrifice for you and your brother. And he's like, and now you're telling me you want to go back to that world that we escaped. Like you want to do that? I'm insulted. I'm offended. I'm angry. Mm -hmm. And so we left the house that night and we're driving back to campus. And my friend was like, God, man, can you believe my dad? And I was like, yeah, actually I can. Like I can believe yeah. both of you, right? Yeah. Like yeah. I yeah. believe you and your desire and your parents formulated you in this way to get you to this space. And like, God, hearing your dad, I can't imagine that passion, like, that, that feeling, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I was like, how do we wrestle with the complexity that in that situation, both. I think both are right. <laughs> like, Have you seen the, there's this picture of two people standing <laughs> and there's a six in between them. So no, like if we're, we're sitting here, yeah. so like say I see a six, yeah, you see and I nine. see a nine, and we're both right. Yeah, that's brilliant. I have not seen I'll, that. I have. There's a thing on it. I'll send it to you. I would love to share that sometimes with my students when we're wrestling with that. So yeah. like, do you guys see that in your world? Like, is this a I'm working with college students uh, and that's no, the struggle, this is or this, okay. and this is part of why we're doing this because it's not as simple. It's not binary. It's not one or zero. It's not yeah. yes or no. It's not on or off. And, um, I mean, that situation, like even those two scenarios, like his dad seeing what they got away from yep. to get them a better life. He said, you want to go back to that world? It's like, well, that world's not even the same mm -hmm. because this is how many years removed. Like, what is that world now? Right. And there's so like so much complexity and it's, it's a lot easier to not even try to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, I mean, and it's in to Rodney's point, it is part of what we're trying to do by talking about stories, right? Like where you came from, all of these things, because we are inundated with information. Yep. Everybody is trying to get everybody's attention. So we have to simplify to the lowest common de denominator. And that turns out to be two because it can't be one or otherwise it's a whole number, right? Like, <laughs> and so we have to. We have to look at these two different scenarios in every situation rather than understanding that, oh, you are, you know, liberal on this, conservative on this, if we're talking politically or whatever it may be, and just trying to, it's absolutely um, something that we see every day is, is the, hey, I did as a that's an awkward moment there. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie was trying to be smooth and set stuff up on recording, so yeah. we're good uh, now. Silky smooth. Uh, and so we we have we have a a missed uh, Skype section. Is that what you're telling me? Maybe. We do, we do, okay. but we're gonna be that's okay, okay. <laughs> because everything else is gonna work. Because everything else is good. It's, it's yeah. golden. <laughs> so I mean, Wait, I wanted a, to say something real quick on that on that point. I want to ask yeah. a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, Keith and I have talked about this. We think it may or may not have something to do with millennials, like the way, and not necessarily millennials, like how millennials are raised. Yeah. Um, making decisions seems to be a very hard thing. Oh, 100%. And we, do you have any idea why? So you agree with that? Yeah. Do you have any idea why? So I had, let me give an example of one where I first kind of saw that. Several years ago, I led immersion trips out of one of our offices here. And so I had a class. It was just a one unit class with the leaders on these various trips, right? So if you were leading, one of these trips because we kind of have the student empowerment model where the students can we, are really can we answer where here is oh yeah here at loyola marymount university in the great city of los angeles l a l a <laughs> so i'm leading this course and you know it's with the student leaders and so their final project was to create basically the packet or the booklet that they would give to the student participants <laughs> And so I went to him and I was like, all right, so your final project, that's, you know, 40% of your grade is create a packet that will have everything you think it's important for your participants to know on this trip. And then I shut up and like a number of the students are like, well, how many pages? What about like, what sections does it need to cover? And I was like, whatever you think your student participants would need, that's what you're putting in this. And they're like, well, and some of them got like really pissed. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're like you're not giving enough clarity on this. And I was like, that's intentional. Like, do you think that I'm going to let you take a poor product to your group? Of course not. And I said, but for me, it's a thing of, you might come up with something that I have never thought of if I don't put parameters on this. And if I put parameters and tell you what topics and what sections, you're just going to do that. And, you and I miss said, this great idea. Yeah. And you're going to miss this great idea. And I said, at the end, I'm reviewing these. And if you miss something I think is important, like, Hey, what flights are you on? Like, of course, we're going to talk about that and we're going to build it. And so I think 
for better or for worse, what's gone on, you know, like people always kind of love to critique this generation that I work with, right? Yeah, it's and unbelievable. Yeah. I always and technically I'll say, like, I think Keith and I are on the edge of being millennials. Yeah. I don't identify strongly with but there, I have millennial-ish tendencies. Yeah, there's like a total, we should Google this later, but there's a thing of like when you're right on that edge yeah. of like you knew what dial-up modem was like. Yes. You knew how to live with Facebook <laughs> like and without it. In between, like yeah. We're the gappers in between. The 78 to 82. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right? But yeah. people critique this group, and I always kind of, right, if I'm at a party or somewhere else, people are like, oh, you know, the student, it just got to be horrible, right? And I'm like, oh, no, nah, if you could see them the way I see them. Like... They have their challenges but just like amazing. anyone else, but they're incredible. Yeah. They're brilliant. They're compassionate, et cetera. And so I think like, you know, and we see this around the college admission thing where we've set people up with this idea of like, you need to do X, Y, and Z, and you need to do it precise to succeed. Mm. And if you do not, you will screw up. And so we've kind and of if you spent, do, you will succeed. Like, yeah. And then what happens when you don't is right. a whole other crisis point. But I think we've set them up for like, you just need to follow directions. You need to do this. You need to have this on your resume. You need to be able to speak this. And so they're just reflecting what they've been trained. And part of what I see our work doing at the university is kind of to actually break them out of that training. Like, I do want them to be smart and kind of strategic on how they engage with people. But I'm also like, I need you to engage with your own creativity. I need you to not be afraid to put something out there. And so we often talk in my world about how do we also celebrate your failures? <laughs> like, mm. how do we be like, cool, you went for it and you failed. And what have you learned from it? So I think we've trained them that way. And part of it is how do we untrain people from that? And that's not easy to do while still, quote unquote, training someone to be good when they land in the workplace. Right. Mm. Like it's a balancing line. You know, we we as full time jobs have we we're in tech yeah. um, and the you know millennials is is it just a, a demographic that gets discussed all the time because you know hmm. we love to demographic everything these days fit everything um, into a box yeah <laughs> everything's got its box um and i find it frustrating like <laughs> we have a really close personal friend who's actually been on the show who has <laughs> he'll give you um his perception on millennials like... <laughs> <laughs> so he and i can we have an argument if we do like an yeah, argument podcast be, after oh, this for just sure. record that podcast <laughs> but i think this is one of those topics we don't we we generally as a society accept it in the graduated um, we'll call it the professional space of, oh, those millennials, right? No. Like it's this thing that, that happens and we kind of just brush it off unless you're a millennial and I'm sure you hear it differently. Yeah. But you said something like, see them how I see them. Can you, like you brushed over it yeah. and yeah. let's get into that. Like, I really want to yeah. get that perspective from you because Rodney and I have had this conversation a lot yeah. and I think he's brought me, we talk about one of those discussions that Rodney brings along the journey a little bit um he's helped me modify the way i think about this conceptually and i'd love to hear from you on this since you're around them all day so i'm actually going to talk about it first from an interesting point of view um before so i was at lmu for a number of years working i left for a while to go work at tom shoes and ran some of their immersion oh, programming yep yeah or as they were very big on calling it around here, Silicon Beach, since they're oh, down right off Jefferson. Right, yeah. And uh, yeah, lots so. of marketing around Silicon Beach. But yes. so when I worked at Tom's, I was there when a couple of people were really kind of obsessed talking about the millennial consumer, right? So we were trying to figure out our marketing strategies, all that. And a few people in these meetings kept talking about the millennial consumer, the millennial consumer. And one of my peers said it where I was like, you know, like when someone says something and it's so simple, but you're like, oh, my God, my mind's blown. Yeah. She's like, we keep talking about the millennial consumer. Which one? Right. Mm. And like, mm. I'm this white male in my mid 30s. She is a African-American female in her late 20s. And she's like, you and I are millennials. I don't think we're looking for the same thing when we're looking at our <laughs> shoes. Like, <laughs> not at all. Right. And like, it was this moment of like, oh, yeah, we put everyone into this big consuming box and like a millennial who has struggled in a socioeconomic sense and has had to hustle their entire lives is very different from a millennial who has had every privilege you could hope for in life, mm -hmm. right? And it's not that one's right and one's wrong or one's better or one's worse, but we have to recognize people are coming from all these different spaces and they're being thrown into this broad category, just like, like American, right? Yeah. Like my American is very different than my dad's American than 
America in the middle of the country, then America in Florida, and then America in Puerto Rico. Like, we could go all around, right? But with these students in particular, you know, if we were going to try and say, like, what do you see as a strain? I think one thing I do see that could be kind of that connective tissue, and of course there's outliers, are I think here more than ever, I see students anxious and kind of antsy to find a way to do good and infuse mm. meaning into their lives, mm. no matter where they want to go, right? So it used to just be like, I think, like, oh, I want to do good. I'm, of course, I'm going to work for the nonprofit sector, maybe the government, et cetera. And I've got students who are like, I want to work for Microsoft and I want to find a way to infuse meaning in this area. Or I want to create products in a way that are accessible to people that typically they're not targeted towards, right? And they don't know how they're going to do that yet. But they're very, very much saying like, I want good as part of my career. I don't want to mm. just kind of separate that. And so I see that as a big thing. And then again, like, you know, I think the big hit on them is like, oh, they're fragile and they complain and this and that. But I actually think what we're seeing a lot of times is mental health, things like that are becoming destigmatized in a way where people feel safe proclaiming <clears throat> and saying like, yeah, I got anxiety. And like, I'm no longer going to hide that. I'm no longer going to be ashamed of that. And so they're using services more to support them. But to that outside world, it's like, oh, see those little weak ones? And I'm like, you think it's weak for someone to be vulnerable and address like their biggest crisis point and become stronger from it? I disagree. You know, mm -hmm. so I think they're overall the students I work with are pretty incredible. Do you have some bad ones? Of course. Just like any generation, any sector of our world, you could always find the good on and the bad. The gener like, I think the number one thing I hear on millennials is they're entitled. Mm -hmm. And I was, I'm, it's interesting to me because I, I think back to every generation yeah. that I've be, been in contact with and every generation has people that are entitled in it. Yep. It, sh it presents differently, but everybody has, or every generation has it. And to your point, which one? Like, yeah. which one? Yeah. Well, and it's like, you know, so when I led these trips to Tijuana, we would have an element that was strongly focused on immigration and just seeing it firsthand. So we would take students to this place called Casa del Migrante, and they would have dinner with men who had just been deported from the U.S. Mm. And one of the more powerful, beautiful, funny moments would always be, I wouldn't kind of say much to the students, even though I knew what was coming. We'd give them the basics. They'd sit down at dinner and, you know, let's say I had some students who didn't speak Spanish well. They'd be struggling with whatever Spanish 101 they had, you know, like, uh, e tu, da, da. and then <laughs> one of the men would just go, D do you just want to speak in English? Would that be easier? <clears throat> and they would kind of all laugh under like the foolishness of it. And then they'd say like, I didn't know you spoke English or something to that extent. And half the time <laughs> the guys would say, well, yeah, I lived in the U.S. 30 years, 40 years. My kids are there, whatever else, right? And so we kind of culminated this weekend at a place called Friendship Park. And Friendship Park is the one place on the border on Saturdays and Sundays between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. on the U.S. side. It's a no questions asked open space. No one asks for documents, anything else. You can approach mm. the border wall. And on the other side, and it's right next to the ocean. So it's literally... If you go in Tijuana and you go as far west as possible or San Diego as far west as possible on the border, you hit Friendship Park. And on the other side is this vibrant life on the Mexican side. It's just open and it's a park and it's beautiful. And people encounter one another. And so you see people through this fence where you can maybe fit a pinky through it, kind of touching their loved ones and talking to their loved ones in person. And it's this really visceral, mm. emotional space. But again, to that point of which millennial, like my students who don't have immigration as a part of their history in the last one, two, three generations, still found it powerful. But my students whose parents were undocumented, whose uncle was undocumented, whatever it may be, or anyone who had recently migrated, that space was very different for them. It was very painfully emotional for them, right? And so like to put both those kids in the same bucket, mm. I think is really unfair. Like we actually have to kind of dive into the nuance of like, Hey, John, I'm glad that this new world was revealed to you and you're emotional because you've never seen anything like this. And also over here with Elena or whoever it is, how are you feeling? Because this just triggered your family's journey and you're seeing the possibility of your own family at this fence one day. Right. So like I'm kind of rambling, but I think it's that thing of like, it's not fair to just segment all of them. It's finding you, those ways for nuance in your answer it makes me realize and maybe i'm wrong and you being in academia maybe you uh have a better answer to this but 
the the millennial generation seems to be the generation we flagged with a personality. Hmm. Whereas, like, if you think baby boomers, do we think tough? Like, Hard what work. would you yeah. define the person? Just work, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's it. But that's not. It's not really anything else other than they worked uh, the gen x or whatever like you don't really think about these other generations in personality terms yet with the millennials they're yeah. sensitive they're entitled they're all of these negative things um i wonder I, I i'm i'm so curious and i have no idea why why that actually is the case well i think it's also uh, like we tie them to certain things, right? So I think a lot of times in that same conversation of entitlement or whatever else is uh, and them and their smartphones. They can't get their heads mm-hmm. out of their smartphones. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember the guy's name, but the founder of Wired Magazine was um, interviewed once by a woman named Krista Tippett who runs like a faith and spirituality podcast. And it was a very fascinating pairing, right? Like the guy for Wired Magazine and faith and spirituality. And he said these two things that stuck with me where he's like, as we go with technology, I wish we were more like the Amish. And he's like, and I know it sounds like a bad joke or the setup to a bad joke, but it's not. And he's like, the Am- Amish are not anti-technology. Mm-hmm. They actually ask questions of anytime you're going to integrate something new into the community, the questions are, how does this impact my family and how does this impact my community? And he's mm-hmm. like, so he talked about the horse drawn carriage, which we often associate. And mm-hmm. he said, the beauty of that is that can only go so far. So you are purchasing in your local economy. And so he said, I wish we had that same adaptation when we looked at phones and other things and said, how will our use of for this impact my family and my community? But the other part he said is like for hundreds of years, we've had to navigate and figure stuff out, right? Like the wheel took a long time. Other things like (laughs) social media is what? 15 17 years old if we're not going to count Facebook. myspace right like uh, yeah, nobody I mean, counts myspace yeah, you're not, i, I know think you're it's still around somehow facebook. actually Poor Tom. Facebook, i think facebook went public and well, not public financially but they went out of the university i think in what 2007 seven so, ish, right that's when they opened to yeah. other universities outside of like yeah, yeah. so his yeah. whole point was like it's only been around a handful of years like give us time to figure it out and i think yeah. that's part of it right you know so like yeah, I mean, I'd be curious when you guys are in the workplace where you're at. I mean, do those other generations get the same group talkings, or is it only no, that no, we talk about just millennials? millennials? It's is just the millennials. Only millennial. It's it's fascinating from a demographic in the in the workspace. It's it's black males, black females, white males, white females, Asian, but women yeah. um, get you know. But, but then millennials, mm-hmm. like it's the only ge- we, that no one's Politics. talking about any other generation other than millennials as a generation and it's almost like it became this like you said this marketing term yeah that organizations grabbed onto and said how can we market to them and create a capital flow around a group of people yep that's it's interesting because i've read uh, some financial reports on like uh how like how millennials move in the world based on money. Yep. And they're very responsible. They're very much thinking about their families and how they're going to support their families when their families are retired or uh, ill or whatever. Right. Um, But they also have a connection with doing good. So you see all these um, social enterprises popping up that are able to make money, Tom's, Yep. um, that, but also have a social mission. Yeah. uh, In giving back. So, it's a very different space, I think, for a lot of people. Because, like, I, I I hear my siblings talk to my parents about like doing what they love, and my parents are like, "What? Yeah, what are like, you talking about? No, yeah. no, I did it because I had to feed you three yeah. mongrels. Like, yep. <laughs> you get to go do, do what you love you, on you don't Saturday get to night. Do what you love? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think that's also a reflection. The this is this is one of the most dissonant effects of human behavior I find to be most fascinating is every generation complains about the next generation. Oh yeah. yeah. Because in, in every generation says, Oh, you're entitled or, you know, you didn't have what I have yet. Every generation is trying to give the next generation more than they had. Mm-hmm. Right. So we are now Which at causes this kind of, the next generation to be what they are. Right. And so now we're at this, we're at this, funds fun time where the the industrial revolution created and then world war ii especially in the united states created 
the middle class, which, you know, yep. we can talk about whether that exists anymore <laughs> or not, but, um, you know, created the middle class that created housing and ownership and assets for these families to then pass on and create an ecosystem for yeah. me, Rodney. Yeah. And now you're seeing these younger kids who get more, like my kids are going to get way more oh, than yeah. I had. Yeah. And that yeah. ultimately breeds the opportunity to say, I want to do what I love. I don't right. have yeah. to do what I need. And now I, I read this headline the other day. I didn't read the article. Uh, the generation of millionaire homeless, right? Like yeah. people who are living, in, you get these tiny houses that are popping up everywhere. Mm -hmm. People are yep. m creating a minimalist uh, consumer environment around themselves and making more money and having, you yeah. know, uh, more and more income. It's just, it's a fascinating. Well, it's like, it's the, it's the effect of the, here. like the, like the greatest on the boomers. Yeah. Like, they didn't have much. They had to conserve and save. And then the boomers were like, all right, we got to work so this never happens again. So we can just make a shit ton of money. Money is all that matters. Like, yep. it doesn't matter if I love it or not. I got to work hard. And I'm going to judge. And then yeah. the, the, what is it, Xers after the boomers are like, yeah, I saw them work and hate it. Yep. So I don't want to focus on just working. Like, yeah. And it's 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 all it all ties into each other. Well, and I think it's that thing, too, of like. So those lessons on how we deal with intergenerational challenges also apply to almost any other element of the diversity in our lives, right? Mm. So I think a lot of times we talk about diversity here as like, oh, you know, let's kumbaya and come together and like we're all like good people. And I always kind of push people. I'm like, no, like actually go out and seek out the difference. Like go and find yeah. where you are different. Go and find where you're like, you're doing what? What are you eating? Like that's totally foreign to me. And revel in that curiosity. And then when you struggle, when you get uncomfortable too much, that's when we can come back to those areas that were the same. Right. So there are back, those yeah. elements of like, OK, safety. we are humans and we love our families no matter where we're from. But like yeah. we first have to venture into the difference and kind of revel in what we learn in difference. And I think that's that same lesson here of like, how do I look at someone who's a baby boomer and have areas that I could not see as my part of my life and also just be like, OK, how do I find myself asking the questions of where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Who are you? What can I learn from you? And then sure, come back to that same. So piece, I was right? going to jump to this. I'm glad you just said that because yeah. in your talk, you talk about curiosity. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what that, <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> look at you with that curiosity. <laughs> look, at me. look at me throwing yeah. it back. Look at, oh, you. look at big brain on brain. <laughs> uh, what does curiosity mean to you? And, and specifically, you taught well. You talked about like the meaning of it, the root of it. But like, can, can you tell tell us a little bit about curiosity and how you, yeah. how you think about it? Yeah. So to me, curiosity is kind of grounding yourself in this place where you're looking outside of yourself and trying to really kind of look with compassion towards another person, right? So it's kind of in that idea of our curiosity. You know, so J.K. Rowling talked about this really great one year when she did the commencement at Harvard, mm -hmm. which is also an easily searchable TED talk. But she talked about like imagination. And I think there's kind of some overlap in there where she said imagination is more about bedtime stories. It's that revelatory capacity we have as human beings to put ourselves in the shoes of someone whose life we could never imagine. And I think curiosity is finding a way to do that, but look at people and say, I just want to know about you. And I want to kind of find those opportunities, you know? And so like, I shared, I mean, I don't know if I can share one of the stories from my TED Talk. No, please do. I just want oh, to say please real quick. Do. I was just about to ask you a question about it. I was okay. going to say, Keith, just so you know, J.K. Rowling wrote Harry Potter. Just so you know. yeah, yeah, for no, all the people got, in the audience, it's a great book reference. series. Yeah. People can look at it sometime. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a cultural reference guy, but that one I got. Okay, yeah. okay. My wife is the same way. We're like, we were there somewhere once, and people were just talking about Star Wars, and she's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And afterwards, I was like, <laughs> you've seen a Star Wars movie, right? And she's like, no, nah, never. And I was like... <laughs> How? We must like, how are you in your now. mid 30s and you never ever saw a moment of Star Wars? But I digress. Um, so, one of the stories I shared in my talk, and it's one I share with my students a lot, is I'm kind of pushing them to try and seek out different narratives than the sometimes easy and lazier one, oftentimes, that defaults towards our worst instincts. Is, you know, I did this post grad service for a couple of years in Latin America. So, I was really, really kind of fortunate to receive a number of scholarships myself at LMU. One of my scholarship donors, I remember talking to him at the beginning of my senior year and just saying, like, I don't know how I'm ever going to be able to repay you. You know, like I needed that money at that time. I came from kind of a really vulnerable place at that space in my life financially where my mom was at everything. And 
he's like, you're never going to be able to repay me. That's the whole idea. Like, mm. I am abundantly wealthy and I could create scholarships like this. And he said, you know, that kind of cheesy thing, but that really rung true to me of like, but you get to pay it forward. And I wonder how you're going to do that. And that's what I'm most interested in is how do you take the gift you receive from us and give that to other people? And so post-grad service became the space where I knew that I could live in really frugal means in Latin America for a couple of years and really just kind of be with people and learn from people, right? So I always talk about it as like my professors transitioned from that person in the classroom to my neighbor in this low-income community in Santiago who taught me so much about life and meaning and went through two really difficult years. If anyone ever lives abroad, you know, one thing they tell you is when you come back, that transition back home is actually much harder than the transition down there. And for whatever reason, I made the horrible decision to fly and visit family on that Wednesday before Thanksgiving, which is like in the best of scenarios, absolutely horrible. And in the worst of scenarios beyond like what horrible <laughs> could possibly be to fly on that day. Oh. And there were weather the delays. TikTok, you put a great picture there. You yeah. Right. It's yeah. like this beautiful, like packed yeah. airport where I'm like, that's what it felt like. I don't want to be near LAX like the whole week of Thanksgiving. No, like, you try like you don't even drive on the streets near it, right. let alone enter it. No. Like it's no. crazy. So, you know, we're there, we're waiting. Flights are delayed because of weather. And I had that scenario that, again, I would venture to say most of us have had some interaction like this in our lives where this person kind of sitting across from me just started kind of popping off out loud mm -hmm. right so all of a sudden you just hear this really loud and like angry like this is the worst thing ever and i look up kind of startled and look around and realize she's not talking to anyone she's not with anyone and all of us around do that thing where we exchange looks with one another like <laughs> man we drew the short oh, end of the stick you. to get next to the crazy yeah. one yeah and then she kept doing it and doing it. And every once in a while, we would look up from you know our books, our iPads, whatever it was at that time, I don't know, and would just look at one another. And I had that kind of righteousness going through my head, where I'm thinking about where I just came from, where I had neighbors who were so poor at the end of the month that like sometimes they couldn't put food on the table and were getting by on real kind of bare means. And I wanted to preach at her, right? I like the next time she popped off, I wanted to pop off at her and be like, oh, you think this is bad? Like, let me tell you what bad is. Mm. And she pops off again. And for whatever reason, kind of my better angels take over. Right. And can, can, can I ask you yeah. before you go, like, as you go into that, let's tell it like a story. Yeah. What was that feeling like? Like, cause I think this is such a, I was going to ask you about this story. Yeah. It's such a critical pivot point that we all get an opportunity to experience and you win a direction that we hope to. But I mean, yeah, impossible is probably the word for most of us in this. Like, what was that feeling like? How did you navigate it? And then how did you have gotcha. the courage to do what you did? So that's the funny thing, right? Like, I think a lot of times we think like feelings pair with action. And like in that moment where I respond to her, I'm still uh -huh. pissed and judgmental. Oh, okay. Right. Like, I wish I could say yeah. like. All of a sudden, this grace filled my entire body, and I was like, here we go. <laughs> but I think okay. sometimes we have to find a way to catch up to our words, right? And my words fortunately did the right thing. So my words got ahead of my feelings. And instead of popping off on her, I looked at her, and I just said, I hear you. Mm. And she looked really startled. You know, like were you condescending in it? Like, no, because you were anger? No, like it, I'm it, sure there was probably a little bit of an edge like, in my voice, right? Like I wish yeah, I could tell you yeah. like... It was soaked with sympathy and all that. But I'm sure a part of it was like, I hear you. And I looked at her and she looked at me. And I think this is the really important thing to me is I think when we have to look a person in the eyes, it automatically Everything helps changes. us to kind of changes. change things. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I looked in her eyes and she's looking in my eyes and I think it softens me and she's looking at me. And again, I just say the only thing that comes to mind, which isn't really poetic, I just say, I hear you. This really sucks. And I said, and I think we all want to just get to our families and we're so annoyed. This really sucks. You know, something along those lines. And I will never forget this moment for as long as I live where her look changes and she starts quivering and she starts crying and the tears just start flowing down. And she tells me and really kind of by extension, everybody around in that moment kind of witnessing this. She says, I just found out my son has stage four cancer. And I just want to get on this fucking airplane <laughs> and go and see my kid. And I want to hold him and I want to embrace him. 
And she's like, he has stage four cancer and I just want to get on this plane. And like, what can you do in that moment? You know? And so like, she tells me that. And again, I think it just struck to that emotional moment of like, we are human beings. And so she's crying and I start crying and I don't know what to do. And so the only thing I can think of is like first asking her her son's name. Cause I just think there's this beautiful power in kind of calling people by their name. Right. And like by that name that we want to be called by. And then we sat there through that delay and to kind of keep her company, I just said, tell me about your son. And like, we talked about the depth of him. She talked about this funny thing as we're crying where she goes, you don't want to know the worst part. Like he had the worst smelling farts yeah, in the yeah, world. Yeah, and right. Like it's human. And we just yeah. kind of, collapse in laughter until our flight's ready and we get on board and this man sits down next to me and is like I saw what you did out there I was really good and I think that's the interesting thing of emotions right is I felt anything but good in that moment like I felt like I was judging this person and you know if we're going to use the phrase kind of but by the grace of God Mm -hmm. I managed to say the right thing instead of the wrong thing and I think about a lot of had I not said that the narrative I would take away from that experience was there was this really crazy, annoying, horrible woman in the airport and she drove me insane and she was so entitled, just complaining, just and... complaining, wouldn't shut up, yeah. et cetera. Right. And now the story I'm telling you paints a very different picture. And so like that to me is curiosity of like, don't just look at what's given to you. Look and actually have the audacity to be like, maybe life's more complex than I'm giving credit for in this moment of being tired. And what are the questions I need to ask to kind of see if that complexity is there. And sometimes it's not, right? That woman in another sometimes situation it is what it is. <laughs> might just be a really annoying lady who's privileged and entitled. But like, yeah, how yeah. dare us make the assumption without actually right. figuring it out? Did, Don't do, assume their intent. What did yeah. you, say? you said that we often assume that our feelings align with our actions. Yeah. yeah. Our words. Our words. Yeah. Words, actions. Yeah. yeah. Man. But isn't it that thing, right? Like, we all have this of head and heart. And like it's at 18 inches and it's the journey of a lifetime as this woman's sister Peg used to stay at LMU. Um, you, you, you gave the deaf or the root of curiosity and it's curios. Yes. I believe. And it's yes. to care. Yeah. So it comes from care is kind of the origin of that word. It's the Greek. I think curios. I should have those notes exactly in front of me. I watched but... it recently. I think I'm feel pretty confident. Okay. That I was curious. <laughs> yeah. Um, you called me shortly after and told me. I, uh, <laughs> I really, really, really like that. Yeah. Like that, that, that you found the, the, the root of that. And, yeah. um, just getting that, like to care, like it's not, yeah. cause I think when I think of the word curiosity, I think of questioning and like, just yeah. totally. questions. but it's not just questioning. It's like, no, I want to get you. Yeah. I want to, I want to, I care. Yep. And that's why I'm asking. It's not just like, like interrogating. It's yeah, not interrogating. Exactly. No, it's a different yeah. thing. I want to know the answer to the question. Like as in its simplest yeah. basic form, right? Like it's, yep. I'm going to ask you a question, not because I want you to come to some different conclusion or to condescend to you or to belittle you. I'm asking you because I sincerely want to know the, the answer to the question. And I think it's also I, like, um, oh, go ahead. Go. No, no, please. No, so I was going to kind of switch to a different story. So all you. I was going to switch as well. (laughs) Okay, then I will do the switch. And if you don't like where I'm switching, be like, no, my friend, this is where we're going right now. Up on board. You got the reins. Um, So I think it's also that a lot of times we live in this instantaneous world where sometimes like the curiosity engages itself well beyond the time that we would expect and well beyond the time that the person kind of viewing from the outside might see, right? So I said that like I led these weekend service and immersion trips to Tijuana. And I always say when you lead service trips or justice trips like that, you know, you have a number of people who are already bought in who you know are going to like really just kind of thrive in that experience. You have a bigger bulk where it's like if I do my job right, I'm going to expose people to an opportunity that's going to really impact them. And then I would say you got one or two people where it becomes pretty clear of like, my job is just to keep you safe and get you home. Like you are not engaged. <laughs> you are not anything else. Right. To get you back to your family. And like a friend of mine long ago, cause I started my work in campus ministry and the two pieces of advice he gave me that were brilliant were this thing of like use hand signals when giving people instructions. Cause as groups, yeah. they don't listen. This and then awesome. to cuss because people are worried that you're a quote unquote campus minister and you're holier than thou. Yeah. So I'm pretty liberal with my like, cussing with students cussing around me because I think they need to have a message of like, come as you are, like come as you are and enter the space as you are. So you can actually engage in a meaningful way. And we're on this trip to Tijuana and this kid is cussing 
if this reference point will make sense to some of the listeners, like more than a Goodwill Hunting movie, right? Like <laughs> he's making Goodwill Hunting look G rated. Yeah. The F bomb is like yeah, every yeah. other word. And so finally I had to be like, yo, dude, like I just need you to tone it down because there's one truth no matter where you are in the world. People may not speak English, but they know the F word when they hear it. Right. right. And so I thought he was having a horrible experience and we get back. It's whatever. Weeks later, he emails me and is like, hey, man, I really need to see you. And he's a senior and it's finals week. And I'm like, dude, there's no one in the world I'd rather see less than this kid right now. You know, so like I don't do the right thing. I write him back and I'm like, sorry, man, I'm just like the week swamped. I can't. And he's like, I really need to see you again. Second opportunity for me to do the right thing. And I still do the wrong thing where I say, OK, I'm available at 8 a.m. on these days thinking no student's ever going to show up at 8 a.m. Yeah. And he's like, OK, I'm available at 8 too. And I usually roll into work at like 8.30. So now I'm like, oh, shoot, now i got to get there. <laughs> yeah. Like That backfired in more ways than one. Yeah. Comes in, he's awkward, he's rambling, and I'm kind of impatient. And I just say, you know, what are you here for? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, about that. And kind of stumbles into his own truth of goodness, right? Where he says, I was probably horrible on that trip. And he goes, I'd never seen poverty like that. I'd never left the States. I didn't know that people could live in situations like what we saw as we drove through all these different parts of Tijuana. I'd never seen immigration through that lens. I'd seen it only as a news headline. And to listen to this man cry as he talked about not being with his kids, it just hit me. And he goes, so I was probably so horrible because I got so uncomfortable that my reaction was to kind of clam up, get defensive, and cuss nonstop. And he goes, but I just felt like I owed it to you to come to you to A, say I'm sorry, and B, to let you know like that trip messed with my mind in ways that I am so grateful for every day. Hmm. And he goes, and it's changing what I think about my career. It's changing how I interact with people. And he goes on that trip, you know, you said that some people can't financially afford to go on it. It's like $60. I don't even remember saying that. I'm sure it's true. Cause I would say that all the time, but I don't remember it. And I was like, yeah. And he hands me a stack of envelopes. And he goes, the next time you got a kid who says they can't go on this trip, oh my God. I hope you'll give them one of these and let them know it came from somebody who had no idea how impactful this weekend could be. And so he kind of wraps up and he gets up and he goes, you changed my life, bro. And I don't think you would have known that if I didn't come. So that's why I had to come this week and tell you that. And he walks out the door and like, you know, I'm faith believer, all that. So I've got a belief in God. And I kind of have this moment where like I look up to the skies and I'm like, all right, I hear you. Like, don't count anyone out. So I think sometimes even like with that curiosity, if we don't have an instantaneous response, we're like, oh, well, they didn't get it. And it's like, who are we to say they're not going to get it two months later or whatever else? Six years or whatever. Yeah, right. Like you got to kind of trust in that slow work that like if you're putting together intentionality, people will eventually respond by and large. Mm. So, wow, man. Yes. Sorry. I love stories. So I go on. Tell us, Tell us, I mean, we don't have a ton of time left. Yeah. And we've gone through a lot. And I want to know your story. Like, you, yeah. well, you mentioned to something. It. You Can I say something? over it. Like, yeah, your mom and financial. Yeah. Space. yeah. Yeah. It's, um, like, yeah. God. Um, I was born in Colorado to do like the boring biography, and then don't worry, it'll get more complex. <laughs> born in Colorado, spent most of my life growing up in New Mexico. And one thing I always say is growing up, in the state of New Mexico was one of the biggest blessings in my life, right? Because it was the first state to be a majority minority state. So it was the first state where there was a majority Latino and mean white. I actually found myself in the quote unquote minority. Mm -hmm. Now, of course we know that's not how it went in terms of privilege, anything else, but I oftentimes got to be in spaces with people who look different than me, who looked at culture different than me. And so like I found it when my wife and I were going through some things in our wedding where like, you know, I was like, okay, who's going to do the lasso over us? And she's like, the what? And I was like, the lasso? Like, who's going to do the lasso? And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, <laughs> you know, like, we have the couple that's really important to us, and we kneel down, and they do the lasso over us. And she's like, I've never heard of that in my life. And I realized, like, oh, that's just New Mexican, right? Like, mm-hmm. and it's probably part of some different Latino cultures as well, but it was particular to my upbringing. Um So I grew up in, you know, pretty great family and then life happens and my parents got separated. And, you know, I think a lot of times I walk through that space and a lot of judgment of when your parents go through a divorce, it's just, you know, similar to my joke about flying on Wednesday at the best of situations is horrible and the worst of situations it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And when you're in eighth grade, ninth grade, you just kind of have to work it out. And I remember a friend of mine, you know, I kind of ran away from home for a short period and a friend of mine, when it got late, What's a I got short freaked period? out. Like, it was probably a few weeks. Oh, 
Yeah. When like so you like, didn't just you threaten just it. You you were gone. Yeah, I jetted. Like you know, I give myself at least a little bit of credit that like 14 year old <laughs> me was like, all right, I. I don't know what this says about me. I also stole my dad's cell phone and like some money and other Did stuff you pack a before. Bag? Yeah, I took like a little handbag, a little go bag. Where'd you little... Where'd you go? So this is the crazy thing. I went to the elementary yeah. school down the street, and I just hung there, kind of traumatized. Right, and day turns to night, and I freak out, and I call my best friend, landlines back in the day, as y'all know. Um, tell him what's going on. He, in what stroke of genius, you know, got his mom on the phone, and they came, they picked me up, and. One of the things I'll always be grateful for is like she really kind of fought for me to stay with them because I was advocating for myself in that space. And she advocated for me with my family of just like, I think he needs the space Give him and I'll some take room. him. Yeah, yeah. Like I'll take him. Like, and so we spent these weeks of me just being kind of a hot mess. And every night, you know, what I loved was she treated me like one of her own kids, like everything from packing a lunch for me to having me have chores. And at night I would sit with her like usually kind of, you know, in the living room, sometimes in her room, if I was a crying mess and we would just unpack, like, what does love look like? What is this? What is that? Things that I was afraid I would never know. And so I always kind of just talk about like this woman brought me in in this very crucial time of my life. But, um, yeah, my parents went through a split. My dad had a really hard time adjusting, lost his job, went through some stuff. And again, I think I was in such a space of judgment there. And now that I'm older and I see the complexities of life, you kind of learn to be a little more tender, to those areas of challenge. But my mom really kind of advocated for me and fought, you know, I was in a private school. She thought it was important since we were Catholic that I go to Catholic school and she fought her tail off to get me a scholarship at a time when like that wasn't a thing at this school, you know, they didn't have a scholarship program. And I think what's really interesting and, you know, we all are parents. And so I think of this a lot of, I was horrible to my mom and every day she showed up and took care of me. And did she do it perfectly? Of course not. You know, but like, she put up with like all the rage because my dad moved away and she had to deal with all the rage of a teenage boy. And I wanted to get out of New Mexico to just see the world, had an opportunity to come to LMU for college. And it was really this kind of transformative space where like I got to be in a new <laughs> culture. I got to be in a new city. I got to kind of start to create my life. And I think, you know, anyone who's kind of gone through this thing can relate. It took me forever to finally get married to my wife. We dated a very long time. Her mother would tell you with a little bit of <laughs> scorn in her voice about how long it took. And she made sure that I was aware of how she felt while we were going through that dating period. But I had that fear of like, I don't want to recreate what I came from. And I don't know how not to do that. So I'm not going to pull the trigger on this unless I know it. And um when we finally got married, you know, we're at this point where I've got a three and a half year old boy, I've got a four month old little girl. And it's this really cool moment where I get to kind of take a step back mm. and be like, man, not bad for a kid who came from that situation he came from, that this is my life and this is my family right now. And so it kind of pushes me to stay committed to my family. So it's a really long answer, but um, no, no, yeah, I mean, product of divorce, questions. like so many of us. <laughs> there, yeah. there are more questions. So I'm, I'm curious. You talk about the space of judgment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said your dad left. Like, did did you lose your relationship with your dad? Like, or like when he left? And do you have one with him today? Like, what what is that? Yeah. You brush you brush over it really. Uh, I know. Uh, right? Like you don't want to talk about it. So, um, about it. <laughs> so there's this beautiful gift. Those of us that come from any sort of trial and trivial like challenge from that time in our lives have where I always say we have a way to and fortunately you all are a little bit better at detecting BS but we have a way to look <laughs> at as though we are putting the walls down while in reality we have kept those walls safely up around us but right. everyone's like wow you're so honest and real and it's like well you only got a portion of that right um, you're, talking, you're talking to me <laughs> well, I know it's like this damn is, tough interview is, over here uh, yeah. Rodney didn't tell me about this when I signed up for this but here we are live so I'm gonna we keep going with it can't divulge all the secrets on the <laughs> intro um yeah I lost a relationship with my dad for a little bit and went through some stuff and then um again that time of life where we're all at is 9-11 happened when I was estranged from him and he was on a flight that day flying from Denver back home to where he was living in Chicago and there was that moment of uncertainty. It wasn't long, but you know, all of us who lived through it, you remember like you didn't know what was going to happen next. You didn't know if it was done, if there was going to be 10, 15, 20 more things that were going to happen. Right. And so I was in absolute fear until the school came to my classroom to notify me that he was okay. And he was on the phone and it was one of those moments, you know, that combined with a friend of mine whose dad had passed away 
And I, the day before, September 10th, was complaining about my dad to him. And he said, man, I'd give anything to have those problems with my dad again. And it just hit me, you know? So um, we have kind of rebuilt that relationship. We've worked through some challenges, you know? And I think, again, like, so there's this thing, right? There's Homeboy Industries by Greg Boyle, which I absolutely love. It's a nonprofit here in LA. And my students are obsessed with it. He works with former gang members to, and sometimes current gang members, to really kind of help them get a better life. And what I've found is we can so easily look at the men and women from Homeboy, you know, or men and women living on the streets in gang violence and say they're better than their worst mistake. They're better than their worst denominator, et cetera. We can preach that and we believe it. And I'm thankful for that. But we look at the people in our own lives, you know, the people around us, the people on this college campus for point of my students, and we can't do that. Or, with or sometimes ourselves. Or ourselves, right? And so it's kind of like, how do we do that, right? And again, kind of coming for me from that faith tradition, like I think my job is to kind of hold up a mirror to people and be like, yo, you're exactly what God had in mind when she created you. And like push that again and again until a student believes that's true. If you don't believe in God, then it's just holding that mirror up and being like, you are exactly what the universe had in mind. Like it is infinite and mysterious and you are who you're supposed to be. And so we've kind of worked to that space where I've had to navigate through the complexity of human beings aren't perfect and you have to embrace the ugly of them as well as the good of them. You said so much there. Um, I love that you called God. She, I just picked all the it time. Is, you grew up in a single mother family. You can't help but see God as a female. Me, it reminds me of the movie dogma. <laughs> with the, Such a yeah. good movie. That's old school. <laughs> right we are set, really Morissette showing it. Plays, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw it in the theater and there was a, there, there was a couple that walked out and I, at the time. I'm like, I don't, why are you walking out? Like, this is hilarious. But you know, uh, as I've gotten older, I barely I know you, Keith, but I'm just, would work out. I'm just proud that you got a cultural reference that Rodney put out there. So it was good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one we connected over. Times, yeah. you, you said, so I want to go back a little bit because I just remembered something. When that yeah. student that was dropping the F-bombs on the trip, 20, back, yeah. you said he was about to have, it was something, his something of goodness. Truth of goodness? I Truth of goodness. Yeah, okay. that's, yeah, that's what yeah. you said. What does that mean? I think it means that we're all good people, right? Like, and again, I get that it sounds naive in 2019 to be like, I actually think human beings are rooted in goodness, right? Mm. And like, Amen. right? To me, it's just like, that's the truth, right? So I heard, you know, suspend your political beliefs for a moment and just take the quote on it. I heard Cory Booker say this thing the other day where he's like, hope is the active conviction that despair will not have the last word. And then he went on to say like, you know, from a political viewpoint, he's like, I'm not trying to just be, ooh, hope and change, that's it, right? He's like, I am angry by what's happening in the world right now. And he said, but the other thing is, if it took 2016 to get you angry, then you weren't seeing the things a lot of communities were already suffering from and were already facing and those challenges. And to me, I kind of interpret that as like, right, so I work in social justice. And if I'm gonna work in social justice, I need to believe in people's goodness in order to do that because I don't work in it just because I'm angry about injustice. I'm angry about injustice because I have the curiosity to connect with people and find out that, oh wow, I see something so good and redeeming in them. I see something worthy of love that I'm angry that they don't have the space to fully actualize that. And so that's why I'm gonna fight out against injustice that they might be facing in terms of the prison pipeline in terms of racial issues that we have in this country, in terms of what it's like to just be in a black body walking around the police. Right. So like, I think we struggle to do that of like, and I tell my students, I'm like, if all you got is anger, you're going to burn out. You don't win on anger. It's not an efficient <laughs> fuel. No, the fuel is love. So I think like all of us are good. And some of us take longer to stumble into that revelation to ourselves. It's like you said, right? Like, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not even just loving people in our community, it's loving ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I find a lot of the work I do working with students to remind them that they are just good and not because they did anything to win my favor or anything else, but just because I believe they're inherently good. You talk about idealistic behaviors, right? Right. But you also talk about them in a realistic framework, hmm. right? The way you judged your dad. Um, if, and this kind of goes into that whole need to work with the people that we're closest to because we know their worst demons, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I know that you were judgy in that moment and that you really didn't mean to ask that woman, like, I wanted to actually hear you. But the reality is you did the right thing and you did the good thing. So how do you ultimately get to this place in your life 
is it the friend's mom that took you in that kind of framed up compassion? Because it mm -hmm. seems like you 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 still struggle with doing it, but it still anchors you in your behavior and everything you do. Like, yeah, wh how, like where does that come from? It's it's. I love the realistic representation that most people yeah. may not be courageous enough to explore, or they may not have seen and know how to how yeah. to actual how to do it. Yeah, I think it's um. You know, so when I was going through the divorce of my parents, I yeah. could sit with you and go on for hours naming the different people who did incredibly beautiful things for my life. You know, so I could sure. talk about the teacher that when I cried in his class because I was missing my dad and hated that, you know, this former college linebacker of a teacher who started mm -hmm. crying with me and gave me this message of, we always say it takes a man not to cry, but it takes a real man to cry. And he opened up this world of vulnerability for me that I think is so vital with how I interact with the world. I could talk about so many people like that, right? Like a teacher where when my mom was in the hospital and I was living at home alone as a senior and she made me come late after class one day and she's like, hey, actually, I need you to meet me in the staff parking lot, pull your car around and I pull it around. And it's her and one of my other teachers who just found out that, that I was at home for that week alone and they thought I might not know how to cook. And so they had cooked a week full of meals what? labeled with the days, right? And just said, I hope you know we love you and we've got your back, whatever you need, right? And so like, what I guess I realized was I was fortunate in the midst of what was probably one of the more challenging moments and times in my life, we'd be winning the lottery the whole time in different ways. And I was fortunate to have people who spoke that real truth to me of, Yes, it sucks that your parents are getting divorced, but also do you have any idea how fortunate you are that you've got this woman who took you in, that you've got this teacher that did that? And so very early on, I think I was able to reframe the challenge in my life to also see where the opportunity was in it and to see where the goodness was. And I think after kind of journeying through those depths of like darkness and depression around that time and being able to work through that with a psychologist and everything else to come out and say, wow, you know, now that I'm in a little bit of a healthier state of mind in my adult life, like, which do I choose? Which path do I choose? Do I want my narrative to be that of the kid whose parents were divorced and woe is me? Or do I want my narrative to be of the kid who was divorced and woe is me and all these people in my community came to my side? And I've also found when I get the space to be that person to other people, it's this really powerful moment, right? So when I get to sit with a student here and I know they're going through, their parents are getting divorced, and I can tell them, you know, similar to that Chile story, but in a real way that I hear you. I may not know exactly what you're going through, but I have a sense of it and I will sit with you as long as we need. That's huge, you know? So I think it's choosing kind of that goodness and recognizing that even when I thought I was striking out, I was winning the lottery in ways that we sometimes, again, are too lazy to really do the work to see if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. I, I, <clears throat> I'm like, so your teacher the the former linebacker of a teacher yeah. what he said yep. uh i'm nodding my head at and it's it's a recent learning for me yeah and and i really hope it's true because listening to your stories like since i was watching your tedx to refresh before we i came oh, here oh. yeah and then sitting here like I, my eyes have been wet like the whole time <laughs> like it's, they're just they're moving yeah they're very moving and and it's partially the stories but it's also sensing your connection yeah. to them and like your genuine just your heart like it's it's wild. Like it's very moving. Um, I, I just, the, the sincerity is a real thing hmm. and I appreciate your sincerity. And I just appreciate that you own the, the complexities of good because it's not always rooted in good. Yeah. Right. I, I just, I'm, I'm really appreciate you sharing the honesty of that moment with the woman at the airport. Cause it is, uh, it's something that's easy to be ashamed of as you, I mean, you talk about that in the TEDx, but it's something that's easy to be ashamed yeah. of. How much time do we have left? Cause I want to ask a question. Um, we have five minutes. Um, quick, I don't know if it'll be a quick answer or not, but a quick question. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Empathy versus compassion. So we hear a lot oh, of people yeah. say the world needs more empathy, which, uh, we feel ways about it, but how do you feel about it? Oh man. Um, right. We go through empathy, sympathy, compassion, and maybe it doesn't have to be versus, like, because the, yeah. Yeah, this empathy is not bad, but it's they're different. Yeah, right? Like, I kind of look at, like, so let me put it through, like, an analogy, and let's see if that makes sense. Okay. Right? Like, 
we're doing a lot of work around implicit bias here right now at the university I work at. And I think it's a really powerful space. How would you, real quick, how would you define implicit bias? Yeah, so bias? implicit bias would be those biases that sometimes come to light in ways that we don't consciously mean to express them. So we may have a bias and it's just inherent and we have no idea, right? So like the woman training us who's like this great expert on it gave this analogy where one of her grad students who was deep in this work was out one day, man falls down, looks to be having a heart attack. She's the first to his aid. She's yelling, hey, is anyone a doctor? Is anyone a doctor? This woman comes up and says, I can help. And this grad student looks up at her and says, are you a nurse? And the woman's like, no, I'm a cardiologist. Get out of the way. Right. And this woman's like, I work in implicit bias. I know it. Like I'm aware of it. And yet in that moment of panic, I had the assumption that woman equals nurse. And so I think it's a powerful place to be for some of our students who instantly get on the defensive when we try and talk about any sort of discrimination. Cause oh, it's an sure. entry way I mean, to say it is, it's a, it's a way to set people. It's a, it's used to trigger people. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So we have a way to say, maybe you're not doing this on purpose and maybe we can start there and go through there. Right. And yeah. then we get to the bigger ones of dealing with explicit bias and those challenges. Both are needed, right? It's mm-hmm. not an either or. And so for me, compassion to me is just ultimately the like, God, the world needs so much of our ability to just feel what's actually happening, right? Empathy is kind of like, oh, okay, like I can understand that. But compassion is like, I may not understand it, but I feel for you and I'm willing to activate my emotions in response to that. Um, So I know we're at time, um, but man, thank you. Like, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing all this. And uh, thank you for the work you're doing. Dude, and likewise, I mean, I kind of talked about this when we touched base earlier this week just to say this was happening. But I think a couple things, if I'm not giving away the secret sauce to your listeners, <laughs> I love that there was no script to this, that there was no advanced questions or anything. And we really just got to converse with one another. And I think that you all put this work out into this space that you do so much work between your full time jobs, this being parents like you are really kind of putting some goodness into the world. So thank you for this. It's just an incredible opportunity to converse with you all. Mm-hmm. Appreciate it. Um, we want to, we're going to end with uh, the question we always end with. Ooh. Um, if you would leave any advice or any words of wisdom or just words to the people listening, what, what do you want to leave them with? You know, that line from Cory Booker is in my head right now. And it's like, whatever your political convictions, throw it aside and actually just find a way in your day-to-day life to embrace this notion of hope is the active conviction that despair won't have the last word. And so we talk about being hopeful almost as this sedentary state. But what I interpret that to mean is hope is kind of putting all of who we are into the world to say, like, I want to make the world a better place every single way I can. And it's not to say we'll be perfect at it. But like, damn, if we don't try. Right. And so I think in 2019, I don't care about your political convictions, but I do care that you're thinking about hope and finding a way to really kind of activate hope so that despair doesn't have the last word.